Hello and welcome to this mini podcast for Science of Rowing. For those that don't know me, I'm Alex Wolfe. I'm one of the new lead authors for, for Science of Rowing. Today, we're going to discuss the article I reviewed, the relationship between rowing-related back pain and rowing biomechanics, a systematic review. Um, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by Frank, who was one of the lead authors. Welcome, Frank. Morning, Alex. Thanks for having me. Yeah, very welcome. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, for those that don't know you, Frank, do you want to just give a little bit of detail who you are and your experiences within, within the rowing world and what you're currently doing? Yeah, uh, so I'm an assistant lecturer in sports science at the University of Limerick. Um, I'm the lead rowing coach and sports science and medicine coordinator for the University of Limerick Rowing Club. And this role involves me working with novice, senior and scholarship rowers. Um, I've been working as a strength and conditioning coach for 10 years now across a variety of different sports. Um, I've worked in swimming, cricket, rugby, um, across a wide variety of levels, youth, collegiate, international, Paralympic level. Um, the majority of my work to date has been in developmental sport. Um, and I always seem to be pulled back to rowing. Um, I think rowing has a habit of doing that. Um, I was a rower um, in the past. Um, you know, as a rower, I probably lost um, more than I won, um, like so many coaches out there. Um, you know, I made a home nations team in the past, 10 the quarterfinals, that type of stuff. Um, but I studied um, sports science in DCU in Dublin. And um, it was during that um, undergraduate program that I got involved as a strength and conditioning coach at my local rowing club in Dublin, which was Commercial Rowing Club. Um, from there, I went on to a PhD in physiology and a PhD focused on swimming performance, um, which I actually find is quite a lot of similarities between swimming and rowing. And then in 2019, I got a job in UL um, and I saw an opportunity to combine a rowing coaching role with a sports science slash strength and conditioning role. And I've been there um, since. And, um, you know, I coach every day. Um, I definitely don't see myself as a pure academic. Um, I love to coach and and, and coaching. Um, through coaching, I see... I experience many things that, that ask me to question, um, you know, am I doing the right thing? And, and the research really guides me in that. So I suppose I have the pleasure of coaching every day, but also getting to research that sport quite a lot as well. Thanks. Frank. Well, that is, that's hugely diverse. Um, that's part of the reason why I was so keen to, to get you on here because you, you are a coach by trade. You are a strength conditioning coach uh, too. And you've had that diversity of experience and that research brings it all together. And for those that um, have been reading or looked at a number of the recent publications around rowing and rowing injuries, you'll probably find Frank's name on either as a lead author or, as a, or a significant contributing author, which is why I'm so so thrilled to have you here. Um, so if we go go to the, the article, the first bit I'm kind of really interested to understand and to help help the, the audience understand is like when you're um, doing a systematic review, what, what is the nuts and bolts of that? Yeah, so um, systematic reviews are really useful um, for practitioners. And why are they useful? Um, well, a systematic review effectively answers one question. Um, so like if I want to, for example, find out the effect of resistance training on rowing performance, I can go and search for a systematic review on the effects of resistance training on rowing performance, and I'll be able to find a paper that summarizes all the evidence to date on that topic, um, it'll summarize the, the low quality studies, the high quality studies, and it'll bring them all together and it'll state, this is what we think about the effects of resistance training on rowing performance. And that's what a systematic review effectively is. It's, it's you know, you ask a question of the scientific literature and then you present the findings. Um, and in the case of the systematic review that I was involved in, um, the, the question we asked was, what was the relationship between rowing related low back pain and rowing biomechanics? And we found 22 peer reviewed publications on the topic. Um, and the systematic review involved an analysis of all these publications um, and, uh, and a write up then of, of the overall answer to this question. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, what, what I really found interesting within the article that the, the systematic review you, you, you led on was how you got down to those 22 articles because there were hundreds of articles that you you kind of got got uh, you started with and you kind of narrowed it down to the, this 22 which I think for me really just shows the kind of quality of what a, a systematic review does it kind of removes the the noise I suppose and brings it down to what really what really um, um what really matters um 
when you do that kind of quality control, what um, how easy is it to kind of say, yeah, that's that's good enough and that's not good enough? Yeah, so the systematic review is all about the um, methodology. Um, and for any systematic review out there, they have to follow what's called a Prisma guideline. And it's a it's a guideline that that literally says step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do this. And you have to follow all them steps. And they do that because it um, makes the process of of conducting a systematic review really transparent. And it should be done to a level of transparency and a level of detail that if someone at the other side of the world conducted the same systematic review, they should end up with the same 22 studies and they should end up with the same end result as I did. Um, so the, the transparency piece is absolutely vital and following that that um, methodology is absolutely vital in order to um, end up with your with your end result, which is the studies and then how you actually um, analyze them studies. Perfect, thank you. So the, ne the next kind of questions are more around the, the kind of the findings. And the bit I'm interested with the findings is, um, it's kind of three parts to it. Like, what were the findings? What were new? And what did you, um, what did your, what did it already confirm for you? So, if you, if you just kind of overview, give us a brief overview of what the, the article, article found. Okay. Um. So the significant findings of the of, of the um, systematic review. There was a number of them. And the first one was hip range of motion is important um, for rowers. And this is probably no surprise for rowing coaches. Um, rowers need adequate hip range of motion. And uh, if they do not have adequate hip range of motion, then it'll compromise the position they're in at the catch. And we know that the catch is where the load, where, where the um, a rower takes load and they carry that through to the drive phase. So if we're not in a strong position in the catch, due to poor hip range of motion, then there's going to be issues. Um, the systematic review found that the pelvis should be in a neutral or anterior tilt um, at the catch. Um, and I remember when I, I heard this in the past, I was always kind of confused as to, as to what that should look like. Um, and it's, it's an easy way of describing it is, you know, if you're sitting on a, on a chair, listen to this podcast, or if you're in your car or something, um, imagine you're wearing a, a pair of jeans, um, or you might be wearing jeans, um, and hopefully there's back pockets on the jeans. Well, you know, if you're sitting on your back pockets, when you're sitting on that chair in your car, then your pelvis is in a posterior pelvic tilt. Um, and that might feel like you're really slumping, you know, really sitting on them back pockets, really slumping into that chair. Whereas when we have our pelvis in an anterior pelvic tilt, you'll be sitting up off them back pockets. And that's what the review found that we're looking for rowers to have either a neutral pelvic tilt or an anterior pelvic tilt. And we want that position established around the quarter slide. And we need to carry that position all the way into the catch. And what that will do is that when we're at the catch, when the rower puts the blade in the water um, and starts a drive phase, that the rower is actually uh, taking that load in a very um, safe and biomechanically efficient position. Um, and it's it's you can kind of use this. It's, you see the same thing in the gym. You know, if someone's doing a deadlift and if their pelvis is in posterior pelvic tilt and they're slouched to their lower back, well, they're not gonna. It's not a strong position. It's not. Um, it'll probably. It potentially will lead to back pain in the future. So it's the same type of. Um, um, uh, it's quite similar to doing a deadlift or doing a, a squat with that kind of low back flexion and posterior pelvic tilt. It's, um, that's what we're kind of looking for more an anterior pelvic rotation at the catch. Great. Uh, your description of the uh, pelvic tilt is the best I've heard um, in a long time. So I'm going to steal that off you. I think um, robbed it from someone else, Alex. So. <laughs> fair, fair enough. We're, I'm pretty sure that person was probably Fiona Wilson as well at some point. <laughs> okay, we'll, 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 we'll credit her um, that, <laughs> for that. But that's a really nice, really nice description um, of, of how, how you describe, describe it. And, and you're right. I think the bit I always find fascinating when you're talking to coaches and you're looking at that kind of... Um, the, the, the rotation of the pelvis and you've seen it slightly, slightly rounded um, back because of the pelvic rotation and the repetitiveness. I think one of the bits in the article describes like the, one of the risk factors of, for lower back pain is the repetitive nature of, of back, back being in, um, in that rounded and that posterior rot rotated position. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts um, around that? Yeah. So we need to be really careful um, 
in particular when a rower becomes fatigued during very long sessions or very intense sessions and there was quite a number of studies that actually assessed um, pelvic and spinal mechanics during these sessions either a very long session or a very intense session and they found that pelv that um, spinal flexion actually increases at the catch during these sessions um, particularly on the erg um, so I found that quite an interesting finding and it's something that a lot of coaches probably know that if you get a rower into um, a session that's maybe a junior rower or doesn't have a very high training age that if you give them a very long session or a session too hard that instead of sitting up off their back pockets at the catch you know as that session goes on and they get more fatigued they'll start slouching and slouching and slouching um going into posterior pelvic rotation sitting on that on their back pockets at the catch um and that can lead to more spinal flexion and thus putting them in a weaker position so i think we need to be yeah. very mindful as coaches when we're prescribing programs that you know uh, it's probably it might be a little bit better to provide a range of volumes and a range of intensities to a session so you know if we have young rowers in not every rower might be able to do 18k session you know some of them rowers might only be able to do 12k with good low back pain biomechanics so prescribing a range of volumes might be something for coaches to consider and also when it comes to a more intense session say like a you know say five by six minutes high intensity interval work um some rowers would be able to do five by six minutes with good positioning good pelvic positioning good spinal positioning but some rowers might only be able to do three minutes or, or, or three by uh, six minutes and um, with good pelvic positioning good spinal positioning um so i found that it was quite an interesting um takeaway from the systematic review the you know the effects of of, of of these longer sessions these more intense sessions on what happens to the pelvis and the spine particularly on the earth that's, re that's really helpful thank you um just on just on uh, one of the things I've, I've been thinking about and i've got probably no evidence and you might be better place for me to a uh, better place for me to understand it so one of the things when you kind of posteriorly rotate, rotate the pelvis um you actually change the position of the femur the head of the femur going into the the uh acetabellum of the, the hip the hip joint um and my my kind of sense is that it becomes a cascade event that if you're if we know that the, the um pelvic rotation oh sorry we know hip uh, range of movement is really important for, for the for the dry phase and at the catch and you're in a more posteriorly rotated position does that naturally close that gap for that that head of the femur in there and actually make it almost um how do you describe it um a, a continuous downward cycle because you're by changing that pelvic position you're actually reducing range of movement and range of movement is the thing that you're trying to trying to preserve yeah i think it have a lot of knock-on effects um you know because when you go into that posterior pelvic tilt quite naturally you're going to go into spinal flexion as well and i look at the the trunk and you'll see a lot of you know good coaches write about this and talk about it you know the trunk is a lever during the stroke and um, from the hip all the way up to the shoulder and you know like i'd say the rower is like what do you want and um, do you want a short like which is more effective a short lever or a long lever and obviously they'd say a long you know like a short spanner or a long spanner and obviously they'd say a long spanner is more effective and do you want a spanner that's floppy and, and soft or do you want one that's pretty you know robust and, and rigid so i think the, the positioning of the pelvis is going to influence the position of the trunk um and it's also going to influence the i suppose the leg drives that a rower can get as well um so what's happening around that kind of key area that pelvic area is is, is really a foundation of, of of power i would look at it as power for the legs but also for that for that trunk during the um during the drive phase and, and just because, because you've done the research and you know it intimately and you are the our coach how if anything how, how has this influenced your your practice um or, or reaffirmed some of your your practice around what you do as a coach um biomechanics uh, study uh, systematic review definitely had an influence but it was probably more the consensus statement as a whole um and that consensus statement was held or was was led by dr fiona wilson um so that consensus statement involved five separate papers um, and the biomechanics paper was one of them um and the five separate papers were brought together um in a consensus statement um on low back pain prevention and management um so during that you know i was i was involved in that process and so i learned a lot from all of them different papers um and the findings of that were were, were brought into an infographic um 
and it was published through World Rowing. So that was probably the first thing. I took an awful lot away just from the consensus statement as a whole. Um, you know, second thing would have been, and I kind of mentioned it earlier on, was the effects of increased duration or intensity on low back pain biomechanics. I thought that was quite interesting. It's something I never thought about before. Um, how spinal flexion can increase um, during these longer um, sessions, um, but also during these hard interval type sessions. And we need to be really mindful of that for development rowers. Um, probably a little bit more cross training is needed at that level um, in order to supplement their volume. Um, and then as their low back um, biomechanics improve, their pelvic mechanics improve, then we can start bringing in more um, actual rowing volume. So, so like not everyone can handle an 18K erg or 30K paddle because their low back pain biomechanics might not be able to tolerate this. Um, so we can't really give them the same program. It's always kind of a thing of, of looking at that movement quality before we, we build um, work capacity. And the last little thing that I found quite interesting um, conducting a systematic review was the role of the anterior trunk. So that, you know, the front of our, our trunk um, at the end of the stroke, I thought was quite interesting. It's something that I probably hadn't thought about before um you know as a strength and conditioning coach um and, and rower in the past i know that um you know our back is very important in rowing um our glutes and hamstrings are probably pretty important as well but i never really thought too much about that the front of our trunk um and with the emg studies what they showed was what is that you know, the, the, our anterior trunk is used as a braking mechanism at the end of the stroke so it's used for deceleration um but it's also used as well during the early drive phase to get you out of of, of backstops you know um and i think there's something probably there you know i've seen some of our national team rowers here um last year doing kind of a an accelerated motion off backstops in order to get the quarter slide um, and they were doing that from the transition point um between kind of early season into the start of racing season um so i do think there's probably something there that not only do we need to have a big a, a, quite a strong kind of a posterior chain but we also need some anterior work and in, in order to kind of to be able to break at the end of the stroke but also to be able to re-accelerate out of um off backstops out, out of bow um and that needs to be at a, at a range of velocities as well as the, as the boat increases in velocity yeah I, I that was one of the things i found fascinating as well and um around the anterior I, I think my, my bit was I was surprised it wasn't as active and, until you get to the the um to, to the backstops and and actually then that that hip flexion or trunk flexion moving forward and back into into front stops I thought I thought it would have been much more active throughout so that was that did interest me more because it kind of that opening out position um and being able to be strong in those um uh, more of a hip extended position, I thought was was quite quite important. So that's one of the things I took from that. Um, the that consensus statement you spoke about with regards to the infographic, I think isn't that available on World Rowing? Freely available on World Rowing, I think. So, and the article is still available on World Rowing. Yeah, it's um, available through World Rowing. Um, the plain language statement is also available and um, through that. So you know. Um, the plain language statement is is literally um, a document that puts these these research findings into a more easy to understand format. Um, it was trialed on on um, rowers on rowing coaches, um, because the key thing from this from this research that Fiona led um, and this this team this great team of people that she built in order to, to bring all this research together into a consensus statement. The key team was to you know, to have transfer, to get it out there to the to the rowing community, the people that um, that need it. Um, because low back pain is a, is a really big issue in our sport. And anyone that works in rowing and, and is involved in rowing will know that. Um, you know, like I coach every single day. Um, you know, I was I was on this consensus statement. Um, you know, I was a lead author on the systematic review and I still have low back pain in, in, in the squads that I work with. Um, so it's by no means there. Um, there's a lot still to be done. Um, but that consensus statement that is available through um, World Rowing, you know, in particular the infographic, um, you know, it's if you click on that, you can print it out through World Rowing and weave it up in our club. I've seen it in other clubs recently, um, and it does offer a guide as to as to some of the things that you can do in your own training um, to reduce the likelihood of low back pain occurring, um, and then what to do if it does occur and the steps involved in that. 
Yeah. I'll make sure that the the link links for the the plain language and the infographic are with us as well, so those those who are listening can can download that. Um, I suppose the the final bit for me is, um, if you were listening to this, um, what would you want? Sorry, if you are listening to this, what would you want the listeners to take away from this as the kind of the big take home? Um, boulders I suppose of what they can start applying within their practice straight away um we need to probably shift away from just thinking about our kind of uh, our trunk or our core training as just doing a load of planks in a gym um do you know there's I'm not anti-plank or anything like that um I think there's a time and a place for them just like any other exercise and I see them just as any other exercise um I think that you know, one of the key things from a systematic review was the importance of hip range of motion and the importance of pelvic positioning. Um, and as coaches, we need to try and improve them aspects in rowers of a developmental age in order to ensure that their movements are of high quality so that when training volume or intensity increases that they can actually hold their um their movement patterns um in order to decrease injury risk so i would look at like say with trunk training i'd probably make it a little bit more specific particularly when targeting um more building trunk endurance um so i'd look at kind of circuits that you can do to develop the deep core muscles um and pelvic mechanics so for example like one of them um that I'd use is, you know, I'd put together a little erg circuit um, at the end of a strength and conditioning session. So it could be something like um, 30 seconds um, holding the finish position um, on an erg. So literally just sitting at the finish position on the erg and um, holding that position for 30 seconds or even 20 seconds. If someone can't hold it 30 seconds, just start off at 20 seconds um, and then progress to 30 seconds, 40 seconds. If someone finds that too um, easy, they can use a broom handle overhead or a light barbell overhead. Um, then once a rower has done that, it goes straight into what I call a rock over pulse. And a rock over pulse is um, just sitting at the finish position um, at the hands away, and you're literally just hinging over and back. So you're going from the finish position um, with your hands away, and then you're hinging over to the rock over position. And you know, all coaches know what the rock over position is. Again, just 30 seconds. And what that is doing is when you're sitting at the finish, you're obviously sitting on your back pockets. And then when you're at the rock over position, you're sitting up off your back pocket. So I suppose it's kind of grooving in in the pelvic pelvic mechanics that, that we kind of want to see based off the findings of this review. If a rower finds that too easy, I often get a resistance band around their chest and, and get someone to give them a little bit of um, resistance back and, um, and that'll make it a little more challenging. And they'll find that when they're doing that, they feel their hip flexors firing up like mad and they feel their um, lower abs working. And then I'd follow that by like a something like a 30 seconds. Um, um, what would you call it? Like a suspension hold at the catch or mid drive. So you know, when you're teaching rowers to to row, um, coach will commonly hold on to the handle at the catch and they'll be like, OK, this is how you hang off the handle. Um, so it's the same thing. It's just that you tie off the handle um at the catch or at mid drive again if a rower can't do it for for 30 seconds do it for 20 seconds if a rower can't do it for 20 seconds do it for you know at 10 seconds with a little rest and then 10 seconds again um and i'd repeat that circuit and then three exercises you know um anywhere up to about eight minutes why eight minutes because that's probably the, the one of the longest races um in 2k it could go up to eight and a half nine minutes if you want um, so then little type of circuits can help um quite a lot but i'd also do that in a skull too um so just um sitting in a single skull and um, first exercise is sitting at the finish position and just doing tap downs so tap downs at the finish so you're sitting there blades are in the water then you um, push the handles down blades come out of the water and then you drop them back in. So just 10 tap downs at the finish. Then I go into 10 rock over pulses. So sitting at the finish with the hands at the sitting at the finish, which um at the hands away, and then you're just moving to the rock over and back. And I'd follow that up with another exercise then, um, where you're at front stops, sitting up off the back pocket. So that's a really um, important cue for them. Um, and just doing tap downs at front stops. And I just keep um um 
doing one exercise after the next. So you go from the first exercise, finish phase tap downs into rock over pulses, then into front stops, tap downs, and do that for again, you know, eight, nine minutes. Um, you can make it harder by progressing the repetition. So instead of 10 tap downs, you go 20 or 30. Um, you could also put in things like full slide placements and um, full slide placements with a pause or even some front stops paddling as well and on that front stops paddling it's i find it's one of the more challenging exercises for a lot of people but the key thing is that you're sitting up off the back pockets during that front stops paddling and and, and you're really cueing you know what you want to see with regards to good pelvic positioning and good spinal positioning so i suppose uh, from the two of them you know or from the systematic review i definitely have taken more um specific trunk training um into um you know my role working with rowers and um, specific trunk training on an erg specific trunk training in a skull but that doesn't mean i don't do planks or anything like that i still do that type of stuff in in in, in an snc program um as well um you know I, something i didn't mention earlier on was you know another finding from the systematic review was around um dynamic ergs versus static ergs um, and from the systematic review, you know, we stated that there was no real difference between dynamic and static ergs with regards to reducing low back pain risk. But it was funny because at the time, um, after the systematic review had been conducted, um, Larissa Therese and a number of colleagues, Kelly Wilkie, came out with a system, came out with a study, fantastic study over eight seasons. Um, and from the findings that study suggested that dynamic ergs might be a little bit better um, in order to reduce risk of low back pain they might be the better option and like when you look on youtube and stuff you see a lot of bigger national teams switch doing a lot more dynamic ergs and um, so sliders and your rp3 that type of stuff um and it was funny you know <laughs> when i was coaching one of the days i was trying to get some of our groups to do more work on the sliders and, and they said we read your systematic review you said don't use dynamic don't use slide you know and i was like i couldn't say at the time um so it'd be shifting a little bit more towards dynamic ergs and where possible and um particularly in training and then obviously i don't think anything is going to change with regards to testing on static ergs but as testing approaches then maybe a little bit more work on 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 static ergs in order to obviously a little bit more specific training in order to get ready for that erg test um, and then just one or two other points, as I, I mentioned it earlier on about the range of volumes and intensities, you know, we can't give everyone the same program. And I know coaches will argue and say, well, culturally, it's it's everyone needs to be doing the same thing if we want to have buy in. You know, we can't have people doing less than others. But if you want a healthy squad at the end of the year, a healthy and fast squad at the end of the year, then you need to get them to, to start line in one piece. And, and some people mightn't be able to tolerate, you know, an 18k erg um, with good low back pain biomechanics or 30k paddle on the water with good low back pain biomechanics they might have to start off a little bit lower um and then as you kind of drip feed in your mobility work and your warm-ups your static stretching after a session your um yoga your um you know pelvic mechanics and trunk circuits um in uh, you know both on the erg and on the skull when you start kind of building that stuff into the program, you'll eventually be able to build them up to be able to do an 18K or get, you know, UT2 um, with good um, biomechanics. Um, so that just takes time and patience. Um, so that's something that I think is quite important. And then just being mindful of when we're preparing these athletes, um, that the extensor muscles are so dominant in, in, during the rowing stroke. So we're looking at our squats, our deadlifts, our Romanian deadlifts, real bread and butter um, for rowers. But obviously with, with younger athletes, starting them off, making sure the movement is, is a very high quality and progressing that. And then the final thing is, uh, you know, this study was just one study of five in the consensus statement and the consensus statement brought everything together. Um, there was a plain language statement from that consensus statement that, that, that translates everything into a very easy to read and digest format. Um, and then there's an infographic with that and, and it's an absolutely fascinating piece of work and I learned an immense amount from it very grateful to have been um, brought into it and been involved um, but that is a massive um, thing that, that everyone coaches need to look at because you know low back pain is 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 the number one injury out there and 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 this is the most up-to-date information in order to reduce the likelihood of it occurring and when it does occur how to, how to manage it appropriately perfect Thank you, Frank. I think your um, the point that really resonated with me just there was 
but how having healthy and fast growers at the end of the season where you when they're competing and I think that that for me is kind of the number one the number one piece there like often people see them as conflicting uh, or two ends of the of, of a spectrum that like you can't be healthy and fast well I think I think it's entirely possible to be healthy and fast if we organize the training in the way you just described it so thank you for for sharing your thoughts there um we'll wrap it up there Frank thank you so much for joining us um this uh, this morning um and hopefully uh, well I've learned a huge amount just by listening to you probably more than just reading the articles and the consensus statement so thank you uh, for joining us thanks very much Alex it was a pleasure and I'm sure some of them um, some uh, some of them ideas might have been taken from the two books you wrote so <laughs> a real real pleasure to be here today and and really enjoy being involved in this research and, and our conversation